back everyone. If you're watching this on YouTube um, or if you're watching this on Twitch, um, welcome, welcome. And part number two. So the summary from the first part was um, hey, when you design a primer, make sure that it's unique, that it's like 17 to 28 base pairs. It has the same amount of A's and T's compared to C's and G's. Um, don't make primers which are AAAA. Um, make sure that you um, have high stability at the 5 prime end, low stability at the 3 prime end. Make sure that the melting temperature is between 55 and 80 degrees Celsius. Make sure that because you're using always two primers, one forward, one reverse, that they have the same melting temperature and the same annealing temperature and minimize secondary structures. Good, so the rest is going to be advanced and um, by advanced, I mean not so much advanced nowadays, but it was really advanced when, um, like the 1990s, when people started doing primers. Although multiplex PCR is still used a lot um, when you do sequencing, um, but um, it's generally easier nowadays because you can use a computer to um, kind of do all of these things for you. So I wanted to do four types of advanced primers. So we will talk about multiplex PCR, um, universal primers, semi-universal primers, and GESMERs. And GESMERs are my favorite to design um, because they take more uh, brain power in a way. So they are more difficult to design um, because instead of having a DNA sequence at which you target primers, um, in a GESMER you're taking a protein sequence and then trying to guess what the DNA sequence is encoding uh, this protein. So it's, it's GESMERs are more interesting. So multiplex PCR means that you have multiple primer pairs added to the same tube when you do the PCR reaction. So it is good and you are it's not so much good, but you use it when you want to amplify multiple sites in the genome. Um, and for example, um, you do this a lot with genome identification. So um, we used, for example, a multiplex PCR recently um, when we wanted to sequence uh, the four different casein genes that are in goats. Um, so goats have four casein genes and instead of doing every sample four times in, in, in more or less serial after each other, um, what you can do is you can just target all four genes at the same time. So you need, uh, for each gene you need one primer pair, so you need eight primers in total, right? But uh, the design difficulties that com comes in is that uh, the melting temperature should be similar of all eight primers that you are designing, and of course no dimers may occur between any of them. So you're, you're just a little bit more restricted in, in the primers that you can design. Um, but multiplex PCR is actually used a lot um, because uh, generally you're not so much, hey, if you want to do genome identification, if you are, for example, want to design a experiment where you can identify between six, seven different species of goat, um, then of course looking at a single region in the genome is not good enough. You need to target like five, six regions of the genome and then based on these five regions together, you can say, oh, it's a Sudanese goat. Uh, and, and, or it's a, it's a goat from France, or it's a goat from the US, right? So for genome identification, you generally want to look at multiple points in the genome um, instead of just a single point. So universal primers are a little bit more tricky, right? Um, so you can design a primer to amplify one product, but we can also design primers that amplify multiple products. Um, and such primers are called universal primers. So, um, for example, if we look at the human papilloma virus, um, this virus is um, having, I think, something like 32 different variants, right? So you have a single virus, but that, this virus comes in 32 different variants, like the, the, the COVID-19, right? COVID-19, we nowadays have the alpha, the beta, the delta, the omicron virus, uh, variant, and we want to amplify all of these. Right, so we don't want to know if you have alpha, but we want to know if you have alpha or omicron or beta or delta, right? So we, we, we want to amplify not just one piece of DNA, uh, but we want to amplify a whole family, right? So instead of having a single target, um, we're actually targeting four or five things at the same time or sometimes up to 32. So the strategy here is that you first need to align all of the sequences that you want to amplify. 
right? So you need to make an alignment where you can use cluster W or some other program hey, that can make sure that you are aligning your target DNA, um, so your template DNA, to make sure that you find the most conserved regions at the five prime end and at the three prime end. Right, so uh, you design a forward primer at the five prime conserve region. You design a reverse primer, and then we of course have to match the forward and the reserve uh, for reverse primer to find the best pair. And then of course we have to make sure that it is unique in all of the different template sequences. And we have to of course ensure that it's unique in any possible contamination sources. Um, so let me draw that for you guys. Normally I would draw on the board, but since we don't have a board. Um, I'm just gonna draw it for you guys how this works. So let me get a new slide. Very good. Um, let me see if I can actually draw because I didn't test the pen this morning. Um, so imagine that we have um, a, a, a virus, right? So this is the standard virus, right? But now we have a different variant of the virus and this different variant of the virus just has a, has a little gap here, right? So it's the same sequence, but it, it, it just misses this part. Right, so this is this is one, this is two, and then of course we can have a third variant of the virus which has a little gap here, and it actually might have a little insertion, right? So a piece of DNA which is unique to this one. Um, so this is number three. Um, then we can look at number four, and number four might be more or less very similar to the original virus, but has an insertion here, right? And then we might have a fifth version of the virus which is just like this. Um, and the only thing that this one has is that it has some mutated base pairs, right? So the mutated base pairs are little X's. Right, so now after we've done the alignment, right, what we will see is that the alignment will come up and we'll have make sure that the ending of the sequence and the beginning are the, the beginning of the sequence and the end of the sequence are more or less the same. And now of course what we want to do is we want to find a region which is conserved in all of these five viruses. Right? So if we would, would look at this then we would say okay so yeah, this part here is conserved in all viruses. In all five it's the same and this is here up to where we have the single nucleotide polymorphism. Right, then here we can see that there's a little part which is also conserved because it also occurs in all of the different viruses. And here at the end we have the same because this is also more or less conserved in all of them. Right, so now we want to find a primer which fits in this region. So we want to design a forward primer here, right? So forward primers are generally written down like this. So you have a, a forward primer which goes here somewhere. Right, and now we can actually design a very small reverse primer here, or we could design a reverse primer here. Right, and of course in this case, the only two which are which are possible is that you would design the primer here, so this would be your forward one, um, and here you would design your reverse primer. Right, so it's just taking all of the available sequences, it doesn't matter how many there are, like I told you guys, like in human papilloma virus, there's like 32 or 38 different variants. So the first thing that you do is you take all of these 38 sequences, you align them, and then you try and figure out what the best region would be to design your primers on. So in this case, the red regions are the regions which are stable across all of the different types of virus. So you would want to put your primers here to make sure um, that you can target any of them. Right, so now when you get an amplification, you know it was one of these five. You don't know which one, but you know that it at least was one of these five. So that's generally how these, how these work. So that's kind of the strategy, right? Just simplified by a little drawing. So semi-universal primers are um, um, more or less the same, but now you want to exclude some of them. Right, so you want to say that, okay, so I know that HPV comes in uh, 32 different types, but only the first six are very dangerous for humans. And the other ones, we don't care too much about. Like if you have the, it's okay that nothing will happen, right? But type one to six are very dangerous. And so what you do is again, the same strategy. So you align all the different types that you have. You identify a subset of the genes that is more similar to each other than to the others. And in this case, we want to look at type one to six, which are the dangerous types. So they should match, but the other ones, so the other like 25, they should not have this piece. So it's again the same strategy, but now we are just going to say, well, we, we find the region which is conserved between y types one and six, but which is not conserved by the other types. 
and this is really difficult because of course like Generally, it's very hard to find regions where exactly the group that you are interested in is different from, from the group that you're not interested in. But this is kind of the strategy, and for the rest, the strategy is, of course, the same as the, as the universal primers. So Gesmers are my favorite, like I told you guys. So Gesmers are um, when you do not have a DNA sequence. Imagine that I'm working on some weird animal which only occurs on a single tropical island and no one ever worked on that, that animal before, so there is no DNA sequence available. No one actually spent the 10,000 euros to build a reference genome for your species of interest. But you do want to learn something about this animal, right? For example, you know that this animal is a, well, uh, let's say a goat, right? So you've, you, 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 sail to some island you find a goat there which no one has ever studied um, so you're not sure what the, the genome of this goat looks like right so you don't have a genomic sequence what you do know is that probably a lot of the proteins that this animal has are very similar to proteins which occur in other goats right so what you what you can then do is say well okay so i'm going to take something which every other goat has for example hemoglobin and i'm going to target my primers based on the protein sequence of hemoglobin so what you do is you take your um, amino acid wheel right um, let me pull up an amino acid wheel for you guys um, so that you so that we can have a more um, amino acid wheel all right, let's go and look at this in here. So let me show you one of these. Make sure that we have a, no, that's not a single picture. Just want to have a single picture which shows relatively well on stream. So, all right, so let me show you guys my Firefox. Okay, here we have the amino acid coding wheel. Right, so we know that the protein sequence is going to be, for example, alanine, aspergine, glutamate, glycine, uh, so just the, the first like five here. Right, then of course we can now figure out to do what, what the possible DNA sequences are going to be. Because we know that if we have an alanine, we definitely have a G and then we have a C. But the third one we don't know, right? And this is because of the wobble base, so the third base which is degenerate in the tRNAs. So, but we can then write down more or less in, in, on our piece of paper, we can write down, okay, so it's definitely a G, then it's a C, and then it's kind of a question mark. Right, then the next one is aspartam, so it's again, it's a G, it's an A, and then it's either a U or a C. Right, so we can just write down the, the most likely DNA sequence of the protein, and then use this most likely sequence um, to, to kind of design our primer on, right? And of course, hey, this back translation is problematic, but it is feasible. Hey, you get a lot of these unknown points in your DNA sequence, um, hey, but different organisms um, also use different codons differentially, but hey, in theory, you could write down what is the most likely sequence of the protein that you're interested in, in this goat that you just found on, on some random island. Right, so you back translate the protein sequence using the codon usage table, you identify the five prime region, so the beginning and in the end of the protein, you identify the regions which are least ambiguous, right, so where you have the highest confidence and that you say, okay, so there's like five question marks here and at this region there's like seven, so I'm going to design my primer of the, on the region where I only have five. Right, so design and match forward and reverse primers like normal, but now what you do is you make your primers longer, right? Because the longer your primer R is, the more, um, the more um, flexibility you have. Like a single mismatch in a primer that is 22 base pairs long is very detrimental. It will reduce your PCR efficiency tremendously. But if your primer is 30 base pairs long, it doesn't really care too much about like a single or two mismatches. Um, so hemp, you, you, hemp, you design primers that are like 30, 35 base pairs long, so that you kind of are sure that it will bind even though there might be two or three mismatches in the region. Right? And of course we use a, a slightly higher annealing temperature at that point uh, because we want to make the primer annealing more stringent. 
So hey, we want to make sure that when it binds, that it binds, but it binds also stronger because there can be a couple of mismatches. So Gesmers are really interesting and we don't use them a lot anymore because it's so cheap nowadays to just sequence the animal, get the whole genomic sequence and get kind of the, the it, just design primers on the DNA. Um, but we, we used to do it a lot, especially for new organisms, right? So for, for example, uh, Arabidopsis, we have all these different ecotypes all across the world. Um, and if you would find a new ecotype, then you would not know the exact sequence of this plant, but you would know more or less, okay, so it probably has part of the genes that are necessary for photosynthesis and these kinds of things. So you would design primers based on these kind of assumptions uh, that you had for the uh, for the animal. And hey, this is this is more fun because it's not just automated clicking around in a computer. No, you have to really sit down, use the code on wheel, write down the possible protein sequence, and then write down the sequence in the DNA, um, and then design your primers based on that. So it's more of a, a, a trial and error process, and it, it requires more thinking. All right, so that was the summary for the advanced primer part. So hemp, you can do primers which have multiple purposes. So you can do things like multiplex PCR, right? Um, friends are um, amplifying not just one region of the genome, but amplifying like five or 10 regions at the same time. Um, nowadays, multiplexes are actually quite multiplex. So for one of the studies that I'm currently looking at, we are actually using like 2000 primers in one reaction. So we're targeting around 900 regions in the genome at the same time. So we have 2000 primers and all of these primers need to be more or less adjusted to each other. So if you add a new primer, then you have to go through all of the old primers and see if they form dimers. Um, so this is really where you need to use a computer to kind of figure out if adding two new primers will upset the whole reaction or if it's just perfectly fine to add them. Um, so we have semi-universal primers and we have gasmers and there's many different other types of primers but these are generally the, the three that are done the most. And so there are very there are a lot of fields where primer design skills are required. So it doesn't matter what kind of a master you do or what if you want to do a PhD later on. Uh, generally, if you do a PhD and your PhD has a part in the lab, you will be a, or you will need to be able to design primers. Right, so had things like real-time uh, PCR, so measuring the expression of genes, um, but also population polymorphism studies where you look at different populations which are in different areas. Um, had then you also use uh, primers. Had, um, you can also do internal probe design. For example, if you're um, designing a new microarray, you're also designing primers, right? Because a microarray is nothing more than a glass plate with a lot of primers on there. Yep. But the very basic rule remains the same everywhere. Achieve the appropriate hybridization specificity and stability. So make sure that you target one region and only one region and make sure that when you have targeted that region that the reaction is more or less a stable reaction. So that two primers that you're using have the same temperature, they do not bind to each other and they do not form any weird hairpin. Good. So. Next step will be just me showing you um, how to design primers, how to use different tools that are available. So how do I use bioinformatics to do my own primer design? And um, there's a little bit of blah blah about databases and, and these kinds of things, but I'm going to skip through that. So again, I hate this. I hate this. I hate this. I hate this. Microsoft Word is such a bad program because it actually just, right? It doesn't recognize that the database is called ensemble without the E. It just thinks that you're talking about an ensemble, so people playing the trumpet together. Um, so it always will put the E behind ensemble. Like automatic text control is horrible sometimes. All right, so um, I wanted to tell you guys a little bit about databases and about basic functions of ensemble and then uh, finding a genomic location. Like how do we now extract the sequence um, that we are interested in, you should add it to your dictionary. Yeah, it definitely should, because it goes wrong in papers all the times as well. That I say, oh, we downloaded the sequence from Ensemble, and then the E is there again. Um, and, but and So how do we find a genomic location that we want to amplify, and how do we export sequences, and how do we then use the different tools that are available um, to do primer design for you guys?
So genome browsers are ubiquitous, right? If you go to Ensemble, um, we see a, a genome browser. Um, let me just pull up a little little Firefoxy for you. So this is how the Ensemble site looks, right? And then if we go, for example, to mouse and we just search for a gene, so favorite gene of interest, um, right? Then when we search for that, then we can click on the first search result. And then of course we have here the component which is still loading, which is the, the genome browser, right? So, and it takes a long time to load apparently. One of the things that I don't like about Ensemble is that it always defaults to the, the normal HTTP site and not the HTTPS. But this is a genome browser, right? So a genome browser is there to show you the whole genome or parts of the genome and it shows you where the genes are and it shows you all kinds of other information like where are uh, variants in the in the sequence and what kind of phenotypes are associated and where are things like regulatory regions. And the nice thing is you can actually add a lot more things. Like so here we see a little CTCF site um, and, and all of these things, right? So, but that is more or less what a genome browser is. So a genome browser is there to annotate and visualize the whole genome of part of the genome. Hey, it allows you to use different scales and zoom in and zoom out. Um, and it allows you also to have a coordinate system. So to talk about where in the genome we are talking about, right? So a coordinate system means that um, we can say that our gene is located at chromosome one at two million base pair. And of course, it's integrating all kinds of different sources of information, right? Like the uh, the Ensemble browser that we were just looking at. Um, so here have, we have uh, the information about the sequence somewhere all the way at the bottom. No, the sequence is not shown because I'm zoomed too far out. Um, have it here we see, for example, the genes and the genes have come, of course, come from a different database. And the contigs, which are the, uh, the, the, the built up fractions of the genome um, come from a different database. Then here we have the genes which again come from a different um, a different data source. Here we have then the sequence variants which generally come from dbSNP. Um, we have the phenotypes which again come from a different database. And so a genome browser is there to integrate all of these different um, all of these different so information sources and visualize them to you in an easy way so that you can just say okay so there's my gene and then there's a regulator and then there's a like binding site for a histone or something like that. Right, so in the end, you are looking at web services. Ooh, this is very poorly visible. But you are there, you're looking at a web server, and this web server is connected to a database, and of course there's many, many different databases that get integrated into a single website when you're looking at it. And of course all of these databases are filled with data which is done in a lab, right? So there's literally hundreds and hundreds of groups or perhaps even thousands of biology groups around the world, all doing experiments. They feed their data into these databases and you have access to all of these um, at the click of a button. So when you choose a database, there are some things that you have to um, look at, right? Because not all databases are made equal. So one of the things that you are um, needing to look at when you select a database to use in your research is the availability of the database and if it is up to date, right? If you're using a database which has not been updated since 2010, then the information that you're looking at is not very, um, well, not very up to date, right? So that's what you want. You want to have the latest information. So hey, if you look at a database, you always want to look at when the database was last updated. Um, but you also want to see if the organism that you're interested in is actually included into the database. There are databases like uh, OMIM, right, on Online Mendelian Inheritance in Men, uh, which is a really good database. But if you're working on mice, it's a useless database because they don't have any mouse information. You always want to make sure that the database that you are using provides you with reproducible information. That means that the database should allow you to go back in time. Right, and that is one of the nice things about, for example, Ensemble, right? Because Ensemble, if we just switch back again, right? If I go all the way to the bottom, it says here, this is Ensemble release 105. This release is December 2021. But if I click here, view an archive site, it allows me to go back in time. So it allows me to look at the database as if it were December 2017. 
that means that I, I have the ability or Ensemble provides me the ability to redo an analysis like it was 2017. And of course, papers which are published in 2016 or 2014, right, they use this version of the database. So if you want to reproduce their research, then often in the newer database, you, you can't. You have to switch back to the old version to get the exact same results. Because our knowledge about the genome is continuously like improving or it's continuously updating. Right? It's the same as the reference genome. For mice, we are now currently at version MM11. So the mouse genome is currently at version 11. But a lot of people are still working on version 10 because they started writing their scripts and, um, um, or they, they started doing their analysis based on version 10 of the, of the genome. But with the new update, everything moved. Every gene moved 100, 2,000 uh, base pairs, right? Because the, we have more information, right? So we used to have like a little gap in chromosome 1. This gap is now filled. So now all of a sudden chromosome 1 became 10,000 or 20,000 base pairs longer. So that means that the positions that you mention, if you write a paper, you should always not only mention the position of your gene, but also the genome version that you are using. Because the same gene can be located at a very different position when the database updates to a new genome version. And that is why Ensemble is such a good database, because you can go back all the way in time and you can, and you can go even back to 2009 and you can pretend like it is 2009 and do research. So if you have a paper published in 2010, then it would have used this 2009 database. So you can redo the research. Right? And that's one of these things which is very important, is that the thing that you do is reproducible. So the old data sets and the old databases should be available. It used to be that the location of the database was very important as well. Nowadays it's less, because now everyone has broadband internet and all of these things, but still transferring a lot of data from China to Europe is going to take time and it's going to be difficult to transfer like a couple of terabytes or a couple of gigabytes from China all the way to to Berlin right it the same thing holds for transferring stuff from Haiti right it's an island they have very poor internet and there's only a limited bandwidth so the location of the database used to be very very important and as a European researcher hey, like 15 years ago you could not easily use Chinese or, or Japanese databases. Nowadays with the cloud and databases being replicated in different uh, Amazon web server zones and stuff, it's relatively easy. Um, but and the location of the database used to be a lot, uh, used to be important. You want to actually look for what is available software wise, Do the, does the database provide any analysis tools that you can easily use? And of course there's a lot of personal flavor, like what do you like about the database? Some people like Ensemble, um, some people like the UCSC genome browser. I'm a big Ensemble fan and almost never use UCSC. Um, they have the same genome but just a different way of, um, of, uh, of reporting the data and it, like I just I'm used to Ensemble, I can work with Ensemble, so using a different database for my genomic information is possible, um, but would take me a lot of time to get used to it. Like I said, we have things, so these are three big databases which provide genomic information. This is Ensemble, here you see UCSC, and here we have the uh, uh, map viewer from, uh, from uh, NCBI. Same data, just a different way of presentation. And so each database has their own advantages and disadvantages. Um, ensemble we already saw. Um, so and drilling down a little bit in Ensemble, there are some things that you should know, right? So if we look at a certain genome, the thing which is important to mention in your paper is the assembly. Right, so the assembly, if we look at cows, and I don't know if this is the current build in cow, but when I looked last time on Ensemble, then the, the, the genome build for cows was done in October 2007, and the genome is called BTAU4, which means that there was also a version 3, there was also a version 2, and there was also a version 1. Right, so um, the, if you write a paper, make sure that you mention 
which database version you used. Um, there's some statistical information like how many protein coding genes have been detected, yeah, how many pseudogenes and these kinds of things. But the most important thing is the version of the database that you are currently using. So when you search in Ensemble, um, hey, you can search by things like gene symbol, database ID, but you can also search for position in the genome. Right. So if you're just interested in a certain region because you found a QTL there, right, like we did a scan at the beginning and we found two of these peaks. Um, so of course then hey, we, we can just search by the position on the genome and then see which genes are there. And there's a lot of ways of combining these searches. But I think that nowadays with Google everyone knows how to use things like AND and OR and quote things to make sure that you search for the whole thing and not the three individual words and stuff. Um, so the nice thing about gene symbols is that um, nowadays, and this is a very big difference from the old days, is that up until like 2007, the same gene in humans could go by like 15 different names. And this is still a problem when you're looking in old literature, um, because some people would call the gene, um, well, let me actually get you an example. Um, let me search for a not so well-known gene. Um, oh, let me show you guys my Firefox window. All right, so if we go to mouse and we search for ILR2 or something, right? I don't know if that's a gene, but just take, uh, let's limit ourselves to mice. Um, novel transcript, yeah, novel transcript just have one name. Now, let's look at RSP, uh, RPS3. No idea what kind of gene it is, um, but oh, the data is really, really slow today. All right, there we go. So here we see that RSP3, R uh, RPS3, is also called D7ERTD795E, but also RS underscore 3. Right, so if you are interested in the literature about this gene, then you have to not only search for ribosomal protein S3, you also have to include these two names in your search, in your literature search, because these are the same gene. However, it, 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 some of them actually have up to 15 different names. So during the last like 50 year of publishing about genes, um, had the name of the gene changed and, and other people called it differently because they were they thought that they were working on another gene, but it turns out it's the same gene as what the other group was working on. And now you have two names for the same gene. And these people have been publishing for five years, the other have been publishing for 10 years. And so now you have like an, a mismatch in the literature. So when this came to light, and this became a much, much bigger problem over time, um, there is a, uh, they formed, or there was a committee formed, which is called the Human Gene Nomenclature Committee. So when you go to www.genenames.org, there is a single approved name for each gene in the human genome now. Right? And this is a massive advantage, because you now have a unique reference for a gene in scientific articles. Um, it is easier to search for genes in a, in a database. And the nice thing is, is that this committee actually made it so that gene families are now named the same. So if you look at uh, cytochrome proteins, they are called SIP and then a number. If you look at different homeoboxes, then they are called HOX with a number. Right? So you can directly identify, oh, these genes are all homeoboxes. Right? So they all have kind of a similar protein structure, they all have a similar function, and so they belong to a family. And because of this human gene nomenclature committee, we now in other species kind of refer to their naming. So we have uh, orthologous genes, so genes which occur in humans and, and for example in pigs, we can now have a single gene name to talk about because the, the gene name in pig is more or less standardized towards the human gene name. Right? But it used to be a massive, massive mess. And depending on which species you are working at, it is still the same thing. I told you guys about goats. Goats have a very poorly annotated genome. 
many genes are just completely missing from the genome since no one has ever investigated them um, and the same gene again can have different names um, there are sometimes different names for the same protein um, and this is just a massively confusing mess and and this human gene nomenclature committee so the HGNC um, actually said at a certain point or they were they were created because of this kind of confusion in the literature and to kind of um, solve this in a, in a single way. Alright, so I wanted to show you guys a little bit of an example. Um, this is uh, ABCG2. Um, so ABCG2, when you search for it, um, let me just, instead of showing you the slides, just do this live, right? We can just look for that. So I wanted to search for uh, cows, right? So just go here, um, select cow, which starts with a C somewhere cat oh crap i just missed the cow all right no don't go to bush babies go to cows cow 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 chinese hamster sea lion cat uh -huh, cow there we are all right so this is the cow genome so the first thing that we can see here is that the cow genome has been updated because the current assembly is called ars ucd 1.2 so it's not called Bos Taurus 4.0 anymore, that's the previous or the, the one before. Um, but the new genome assembly is called ARS UCD, uh, UCD 1.2. We can look at the karyotype, right? So we see that cows have um, 29 autosomes, they have an X chromosome and they have mitochondria. Right? If we then look here, then we see indeed that this is a relatively new genome because this genome was constructed April 2018. Um, we can see that it has a, a 2.7 billion base pairs. Right? So, so just some basic information about the genome. All right, so when we go back to cows, we want to search for ABCG2, ABCG2, um, and just see, so that's a cattle gene. Um, so all right, so now one of these things that we can uh, see, right, is that I made my slides on the previous version of the genome database. So this gene is located on chromosome 6 at 36,475, uh, 36,475,377 base pairs, right? That's where the gene starts. However, the gene used to be located also on chromosome 6, but at 37.9 megabases, right? So that's almost a million base pairs away. So, so from one version of the genome to another version of the genome, this gene shifted almost a million base pairs, right? And that is why it is so important to always mention which genome build you're working on. Otherwise, people might say like, but the, the gene that you're talking about is, is not located at this position anymore. All right, so let's go back. So here we see um, in, in Ensemble, we see a whole bunch of clickout links, right? So we have things like comparative genomics, uh, the gene tree, we can look at the orthologs, the paralogs, um, which we already talked about. And so the first thing that I wanted to show you guys is the um, ortholog, uh, the gene tree, I think. Let me see, no, not the gene tree. I want to look at the orthologs. It is relatively slow uh, today, actually. Uh, Paralogs, genomic alignment. Um, where did I want to look at? Because I wanted to show you guys something interesting about this gene. Um, let me see. We want to go to the gene tree. That's probably what. Yeah. Right. So here we see the gene tree. Right. So we see here that this ABCT. Uh, ABCG2 gene in cows, right? It has this structure. But then when we look, we can actually see that the same gene occurs as well in Bos indicus, which is not the standard cow that we know, but the cow from India. Um, you see that American bison has the same gene as well. Uh, oxens have it as well. Caprinea, which are uh, goats and other like animals with horns, um, they also have the gene. But when we then look, then we see that something interesting, right? Because the same gene, like very similarly, occurs in, in whales. In whales? Like how the hell are whales 
like closely genetically related to cows and this is something that is interesting because like because this database has a has a range of species it actually gives you kind of a tree of life right so we can see actually that here that the genetic relationships between cows and whales and dolphins and stuff and because we also have the the cessations in here um, so and we can also see that they are relatively well related to hedgehogs and Based on the gene structure, you can see that sperm whales and cows are actually like highly related to each other, um, which is which is kind of this interesting finding, right? Um, but if we want to learn a little bit more about this gene, then we can see here the transcript table, right? So when we show the transcript, uh, we now see that this gene has seven different transcripts, right? So this single gene codes for seven different proteins. Um, Again, let me show you the old version of the database. The old version of the database only had two of them. So, like, and that's the, the presentation is not from that long ago, but hey, you can see that every time that the database gets updated, new information gets added. So, hey, if you would use the new version of the database to answer the question, how many transcripts does this gene have? Then you would say seven. While using the old database, you would say two. Um, fortunately, um, both of these transcripts code for uh, 558 or 658 amino acid protein. Hey, but the new version of the database, hey, you can already see that it has a lot more different variants. Hey, they are not that well defined because here at the biotype you see this color, right? And the red color means that there's not a lot of certainty about each of these transcripts. But we know that at least one of them should be really true. Right, so if we look at the transcripts, um, then we have to go to the transcript page. So if we go to transcript comparison, right, then what we, no transcript selected. Um, select transcripts, where is the select transcript button? Why do they make it this hard? You must select transcripts or by clicking here. All right, let's click there. All right, let's, do, let's compare a couple of these, right? So just add all of them, then press go. And then it will um, start comparing all of the different transcripts. Uh, this is not exactly what I wanted, but here you see the alignment, right? So when we talked about these um, designing primers for multiple human papilloma virus, and this is the first thing uh, that you need to do is that you need to align these sequences towards each other. And so here you see the different uh, transcripts. Um, and so all seven of them and you see here that if I want to target transcript one two and four then I can design my primer here right this will amplify only one two and four um, but it won't amplify the other ones and if we go down a little bit more and then we see that at a certain point we should start getting in more of these uh, sequences um, or not because it might be yeah so for example here if we want to target the read or if we want to detect the presence of not just one, two, and four, but also the one, three, then we can actually just design our primer here. And the further we scroll down, the more overlap between the different sequences there would be. Um, but that's, that's how you can use this to kind of use the alignment to figure out where you should put um, your, um, your primers, right? So this is what you can um, use the database for, because the database has a built-in aligner which can align different transcripts for you. So if you're interested in amplifying like a couple or you want to amplify all of them, right, then you would say, no, we want to design our primer somewhere around 81,000 base pairs into the gene because here we see that all of the transcripts have this piece of DNA inside of them so we can actually target all of them at the same time. All right, so of course, Ensemble is a massive database, so definitely just click through it. Hey, you have things like the external reference page where you can go to literature or to Uniprot or to Wikigene. Um, Wikigene is also really nice because it's kind of an open editing, um, an open editing wiki platform per gene. Um, so about every gene, people can write something and they can add information. Uh, the genomic alignment show you the location of the gene and the sequence. And the phenotype button shows you which phenotypes are associated with this gene. And I think this is the region why I chose this ABCG2 gene. Let me scroll all the way up in Firefox. Um, so let's go to phenotypes. Uh, Non-found. Interesting, interesting. So there are some 
some phenotypes from mouse which have been um, associated with mice. Um, but I think the one from um, I think this gene was very important for like milk production in cows, but it doesn't matter too much. Anyway, so and generally what we want is we want to see uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms, right? Because these things will allow us to do things like track origin, right? If we have, uh, because if we would just amplify a region of the genome or amplify a region of the gene, right? Then it would be the same for goats from Sudan versus goats from uh, Italy. But the single nucleotide polymorphisms, uh, they allow us to then PCR out a piece of the genome and then sequence it to see which letter there is. And if we know that all Sudanese animals have a G, while all Italian animals have a T, right, then we can use the results from sequencing to say this, this animal, which we have never seen before, is probably of Sudanese origin or it's probably from um, uh, the origin of Italy. Right, so if we want to do genome identification, we want to know uh, SNPs. So um, in the database, let's just go back to the database, we can go to the variant table, and the variant table will show us all of the known variants in this gene. Right, so here we see that at this variant, at this position, um, there, the reference genome is a T, and the alternative allele is a G. Right, it is a SNP and it comes from dbSNP, so that's all perfectly fine. Then you have like the evidence, so for example, the frequency um, for some of them, and so for some of them, there is known frequencies in different breeds. Um, right, so hey, here we can see that the minor allele frequency in the highest population is 0 0.6, um, and we can actually go to genes and regulation, but also to population genetics. Um, I don't know if this one is in multiple populations. Um, so it's only in, in one population measured. Yeah, but if, if you have, for example, goats that are, or, or if you're interested in cows, right, then yeah, some SNPs have a very well characterized kind of population genetics saying that, well, if this is a T, then it's highly likely that it comes from Asia. If this has a C, then it's highly likely that it comes from the US. Um, so, yeah, but this is, this is not the case for this one because this one is just classified in one. All right, so we can then look at all of the uh, all of the SNPs, right? And generally, what you want to do is you want to filter um, the consequences, right? Because we are generally interested in only SNPs which change the which change protein, right? So which are called missense variants. So we can say uh, turn everything off, um, and then only give us the missense variant in this gene, right? So these are missense variants which which change the protein. Um, yeah, so instead of having a, a certain amino acid these uh, mutations make it so that you get another amino acid. And this, of course, has, a, has an influence on the function. Right, so in this case, um, let me go back to the presentation. We want to look at a certain one. And so it's a, a, a missense mutation means that it changes the amino acid. We can get, we use dbSNP to get more information. Um, but in this case, we want to do RS43702, 43702. Can I just search for that? 43702. Enter. Search. All right. So uh, let me go back to Firefox. Um, so uh, here we see the SNP. Right. So the SNP is in there seven times because it affects all seven transcripts of the gene. Right. But what we can see is that it's located at this position. Um, it's, an, uh, it's an AT SNP. Right, so the reference genome has an A, some animals have a T. Um, there's a lot of evidence, yes, so it's actually been cited in a lot of publications, and um, we probably have also multiple observations across multiple populations. Right, so here we have one of these SNPs, which is relatively well studied, which we can use to figure out where our cow comes from. Right, and um, hey, it changes the Y amino acid to an F. I'm not having a complete amino acid table in my head, but it, it just then it's it changes the protein at position 581. Right, so um, imagine that we want to PCR out this very well-known SNP, right? Because it's, it, there's, there's publications about this and there's uh, things like multiple observations. And so in the next part, in the next part of the lecture, um, we will go through all of the steps that you need to do to extract this piece of the genome 
from the cow genome and then send it in for sequencing um, to get which SNP is there. Alright, so that's it for this hour. So let me, uh, oh yeah, people on YouTube, um, thanks for staying until the end and see you in part three of the lecture. So.